Hello and welcome to another edition of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm Michael O'Toole, the paper's crime correspondent. Today we bring you an interview that should be of great interest to both Gardaí and civilians. I speak at length to Laurie Young, who resigned from Angarda Síochána last year after 14 years service. In fact, Laura was one of 109 men and women to quit the force last year. That's the highest number of resignations in at least five years. The spike in resignations has led serving officers to worry that there is now a brain drain of talent from the force. In the interview, I talked to Laura about why she initially loved being a Garda, but ended up dreading going to work. She's very open and very frank and raises an awful lot of interesting issues. Now, just a warning, We do talk about sensitive issues in this episode, including mental health issues and suicide. Laura Young, former Garda in the DMR in Dublin. I think you were based in the south of the city. Thanks for joining us today on Shattered Lives. Thanks for having me. It's still like former Garda. So I I still feel like I'm going back at some stage. So it's weird. It's been almost a full calendar year since my last day at work. So would you go back? I would never say never however if you ever get in touch with me again in a few years time and say well Laura what are you up to know that if I've gone back to the guards I've been in dire straits I know that sounds terrible if I've mm. but, but never say never so Laura the, the reason we're talking to Laura today Laura re- resigned from Garda Shikana what was it last year uh, mid last year yes mid last year and you joined in 2008 I went through the gates of Templemore on the 5th of August, 08. Uh, the first question is like, was this your dream ever since you were a child? No. To be mm-hmm. completely honest, uh, it was never my dream to be a policewoman. As a child, I always said I'd love to be a prison officer on death row. I don't know why. It's a bit morbid now that I look back. I think I was just trying to be sensationist and get reactions from people. But anyway, I remember late 07 to early 08 seeing, I don't know, an advertisement for the guards. And I remember thinking, that might be fun to try. Just as in, like, let's throw my hat into the ring. One, two, skip a few. I'm standing in my little little dorm room with my linoleum floor with my suitcases, a sink in the corner, a bed in the other corner, realising, oh, my God, I think I'm doing this. And was there anybody, any uh, guard, uh, anybody of, in the guards in your family or in your relationships? <sighs> kind of, yes, but no, not really. Uh, my uncle was a guard. He'd retired long before I joined. And he was kind of like, get myself a cushy number, chill number in the guards. He was no big proponent for it. Um, didn't hate it either, but he just kind of plodded along as an old guard and he retired. He was kind of happy enough about it. My dad's side of the family, he's one of 12 kids and my dad is the only non-public sector worker. So you can imagine the, the family's big on getting into the public sector. Guards, teachers, nurses, all of that. So, um, yeah, it's it's it was very much like, oh, Laura's after Jeff getting into the public sector. OK, cool, cool. The, the pension and the, and the, and that sort of stuff is it Energy, pension exactly yeah yeah but even then just to talk about that and the reason we're talking to you there has been a significant spike in the number of resignations and i have the stats here last year there were 109 the first time it actually breached 100 yeah. in, in, since records began so in just to give the listeners some statistics in 2017 there were 14 41 sorry resignations in 2018 that rose to 77 2019, there were 73. In 20, uh, 70 in 2020, 94 in 2021, and then 109 last year. So there has been a significant incremental rise. And we want to talk to because you were one of the people who did resign. Yeah. And we think you'd be a, a great subject for this interview. And I think a lot of our listeners who are guards will be very interested in listening to this. But I also think civilians who don't really know what it's like to be a guard will hopefully get an insight into the lows and the highs of being a guard from this interview. So I'm really looking forward to it. So you mentioned you joined 2008 Templemore. Did you have any, uh, you mentioned your family. What about your family, you know, your wider friends and wider family? Was anybody opposed or disappointed or annoyed that you went to the guards? Disappointed or anything? No. Intrigued and a bit like, whoa, that's a bit out of left field. So it was a bit random. I was working kind of menial jobs here and there and um, just getting by and suddenly I'm becoming a policewoman. It was a bit shocking, I think, to a lot of people. And that shock value still continued on. Whenever I met someone new and they found out I was a, a guard, I usually I was met with shock as well. Um, yeah, so no one disappointed, but a lot of people are probably sitting back going, this will be good. <laughs> And it was good. I stuck in for I stuck it for 14 years, so mm-hmm. longer than I'd say people expect it to. But it was a forever job back then, wasn't it? Yes, and that's one thing I was going to say. Some of, uh, former guardian and lads would say to me that 
you know, particularly American multinationals, they do look for somebody with law enforcement experience on their CV, even for five or six years. So it's a thing that, you know, I don't think Gardy who resigned will have any problems getting jobs, I put it that way. I think you all are in demand from the skills you learn. I think so too. I remember my dad, um, probably one of the most intelligent people I know, he had looked through my CV. He was like, wow, 14 odd years as a, as a Garda, like you're very employable and you can adapt that skill set to kind of any job, really. Um, I've gone into the non-profit sector now um, and I think they were quite impressed with the, the Garda experience on my CV, um, as well as other personal experiences as well. Uh, but yeah, I think being a guard, well, maybe if you join for six months, you mightn't be as employable. You might be seen as a bit flaky then, uh, which some people do leave after just six months these days. Uh, rookies, as we call them, sometimes do leave very quickly. And I think having a, a guard on a CV for a substantial length of time, I think that's that's great. It's 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 less eyebrow raising as time goes on as well. OK, so let's go back to the start. You walked into Templemore 2008. Oh. What was it like for you? Templemore is the Garda Training College in Templemore for, in, in County Tipperary, for those who aren't aware. What was it like for you, Laura? I loved it. So, so the back, in my, back in my day, it was a six-month period on phase one where you do like law, procedures and policies, fitness training, uh, which was not a huge part of the curriculum. We did self-defense, lots of the basics. And then after that, you go out to a station for six months as a student guard. I spent my six months in Crumlin. Uh, loved it. Now, you're kind of shadowing there. You don't really have any major responsibilities. You don't have any real paperwork to do. It's the definitive, like, the, the benefits of the excitement, but no actual paperwork to do. So you do six months there. Then you go back into the college for another three months where you bring your experience and what you've seen back, study policies and procedures more in depth, tiny bit of fitness you do your dissertation you submit that and um, you go back out to your permanent station then and as we mentioned I was in a per, uh, station in South County Dublin stations a district in South County Dublin and then once your dissertation has passed you get your uh, degree from the Garda College and you're out and I love the training aspect I have to say I love the social aspect it was it was a little bit regimental in that you had to be back in bed lights out by like 11 o'clock or whatever and I know a lot of older uh, older trainees found that a bit of a struggle because they have wives and kids and mortgages at home and they're being, being told to turn off the lights at a certain time whereas I was only 20 20 20 actually 20 years of age so I didn't really that didn't bother me at all but I did I love Templemore which is a controversial opinion not a lot of people love Templemore but I did and I made friends for life there and did did, did it sort of click uh, uh, by that I mean did you suddenly have more guard of friends than non-guard of friends Oh, of course. Yeah, I did actually, now that you mentioned, I did have a few friends who were guards before I joined. And it's only kind of recently I've reflected on that. But uh, of course, yeah, you surround yourself with like minded people. And I even actually kind of stepped away from personal non guard friends who didn't really get what I was working at and potentially would have gotten me in trouble in my personal life and stuff. So I did definitely surround myself with guard friends. I think that's kind of the nature of the job as well, romantically as well. Oh, very good. I mean, look, it happens in journalism. The number of journalists I know who are romantically in, in, involved with other journalists or even, you know, journalists understand what journalists go through. So I can understand why guards, you know, sort of entrenched and, and largely talk to other guards. I think they call it the Garda founder of the Blue family. It's yeah. entirely understandable because yeah. a guard can understand the, the shit you've had in your tour of duty. Exactly. I might as a crime reporter, but I think most people outside probably wouldn't. That's fair, is it? Yeah, it was a joke I used to have with colleagues say, I might ask, oh, are you going out with someone? And a colleague might say, oh, yeah. And I'd say, oh, is it a mule or a banner? And they'd say, oh, no. And I'd be like, oh, a human, is it? A human being? How does that work? I would know what to do with a human being because you get so, I don't want to say institutionalized, but you're spending so much time with this group of people that of course you're going to become close and you do become kind of like a little family, as cliche as that sounds. But is that a, a defense mechanism as well, would you think? For sure. I know when the recession hit, if you think about the timeline I joined versus when things started to tank, I was very, very lucky. I was the last big group to go into Templemore and I think the third or fourth last group overall before the big embargo. So the recession hit, Pay cuts came, extra taxes, the USC, and the media seemed to take on an anti garda stance. And there were several media outlets that had open comments underneath. We won't name them. And I remember looking through when the GRA were battling for our pay restoration or opposing further pay cuts, this, these stories would make the media and I'd look at the comments and I would kind of take it personally. Oh, the guards are a shower of useless Fs or whatever. And I would take it personally because that's my people you're talking about, which is not really normal. I remember discussing this with my therapist at the time and thinking like, why do I, why do I take this so personally? 
And she's like, well, you're part of a team. You're part of a tribe. And that is natural to feel defensive of your people. Yeah, of course, there's one or two bad apples. Or when a guard behaved inappropriately and that made the media, I'd be like, for fuck's sake, we're like struggling already in the media. Like, can you not just book up and be a good person like the rest of most of us? Does that kind of make sense? Or do you think I'm yeah. No, it, it absolutely does. And there's 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 two issues that raised from that. Firstly, just about bad apples or bad guardy. I think they're really important from a journalist's perspective that we do them because I, I don't know. I, know I, mean, I was actually speaking to a guard about this the other day. There is a DPP's ruling that guards have to be held to a higher account. Oh. So... I mean, I've done a lot of stories about guard corruption and alleged corruption. In the last year, I'd say, you know, guards allegedly taking squad cars or detective cars and crashing them on the M50 with, with uh, off their head and cookie, all that sort of stuff. Oh. And I do them and I find them very important because highlighting the suspected or alleged bad guards for me is a very important job because it shows that it's, it's a minority and that most guards are good and decent. And you know, I'll, be, I'll be honest, we don't get our, you know, when I do stories like that, I only get good comments from guards to say, well done, Mick, you highlighted that fucker. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's one thing. But just, I want to ask one question there. It just came to my head when you were talking. People won't understand this. Talk to us about the camaraderie within the guards, because you know what? As a civilian, I don't think we'll ever get that. No, and I can't even begin to describe it in a way that you'll ever uh, probably comprehend, but I'll try. From the moment I set foot into Crumlin as a student guard, I really understood what this means the trust you put in your colleagues you know that even if you had a fight with bozo 20 minutes ago if you're calling for assistance 10 minutes later bozo is breaking his balls to get to help you no matter what i remember calling for assistance on uh, like at two three o'clock in the morning i had the pepper spray out and members came from four exits up on the m50 shall we say practically all of south dublin came to assist i remember like getting chills i was fine everything was fine in the end but i remember getting chills like these people don't even know me, but they came to help me. Now, I'm sure it was very exciting as well. That's obviously a factor as well. I can't even begin to describe to you, even if you don't get along with someone, you'd absolutely pull out all the stops to help them if they needed your help. As well as that, when it came to, if I was confused, I have no problem with asking questions. How in the name of goodness do I give this evidence in course? Someone will help you. I feel like that may have changed a little bit. I haven't been an operational guard for like four and a half years. I went into a, an office for the last four years of my service. Three and a half years, three and a half years, four years, something like that. Um, but knowing that someone, everyone will rally around you if needs be, there, nothing beats that feeling. And that's why I felt so defensive because, yes, there's this one bad apple reach, like in the media, this story about or whatever. And I, but I know the most of us are good people. And you mentioned before, the baddies need to be highlighted. And the logical side of me, I'm a rule follower, always have been a rule follower ever since I was a child. And the logical side of my brain is like, yes, highlight the baddies. But it's just that we're all encapsulated in this one group of the guards. I don't think I, it makes perfect sense, and I don't have any answer for it. I don't have any solution. I I'm not going to say people are going to have to suck it up because everybody, look, you know, who can I talk about? Crime reporters get a bad beat. Journalists get a bad beat. Yeah. Uh, so I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I, I absolutely do understand where you're coming from. Officers have messed up, and something yeah. will it'll be in the media, and I know for a fact only officers can do that what's being reported but yet it's the guards are all corrupt i'm like oh i wish people wouldn't read the headline would actually look and realize it's actually inspectors and up or whatever uh yeah so the way i from the outside view the the camaraderie is look I, obviously we, we, we reporters like me would speak to a lot of guards and it's great i always laugh the way they sort of they'd be slagging each other off to me but i know they would die for each other and 15 minutes later and it, it, I just find it fascinating and sort of uplifting that they can say he's an awful bollocks but 10 minutes later they'd be rolling around the floor to get, uh, against gouges or whatever oh, sure. exactly the same Do you, are you familiar with the expression Monday after nights does that ring any bell no no oh. go on well the old roster not the current roster the old old roster we would work a week of nights We'd be off Monday night. And if you've ever done night shifts you'll know on the Monday night you'll be wide awake so Monday after nights was a big social thing <sighs> And you'd head into Flannery's or head into Coppers or wherever, and you'd see the same group of people. You see, oh, there's Crumlin, there's Bally mm -hmm. da 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 da, because all the same units would be off that Monday after nights. And it was like it was a social event you didn't miss. So not only were you spending all this time with people in work, you were going out, you were socialising together. Christmas parties were down the country for one or two nights. Sometimes it was uh, abroad. It was genuine friendship and the camaraderie. It's integral. Without that. You don't have an organisation, I don't think. And again, that sounds very romanticised, but it, it's, it's so powerful. It sounds very intense, is it? 
Do you have intense feelings of camaraderie and friendship and togetherness? I don't know if I call it intense. I don't know if I call it intense. It's very strong. Very strong for sure. And like, obviously, if you have a group of a unit of 10 people, not everyone's going to get along for sure. But I think it's just it's invaluable. And I think it's being lost in, in the organization right now. What happens when you don't get on with somebody in a unit? Because it is, you know, if you're a unit working together. Just get on with it. Unless there's an actual proper conflict. And then you just speak to the sergeant and say, look, moving forward, can you detail us for different duties, please? Don't put us in the car for a 10 hour shift together, please. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about the bad times in a while, but let's talk about the early days and the good times first. Hmm. Your first you know, X amount of years, it's up to you to say how long it was. What did you enjoy about it? I loved night shifts. I later learned to hate those, but I loved night shifts because they were always busy. Now, when I joined, went to the district I first went to, we would have six patrol vehicles covering the area. Can you see where this is going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd uh, we'd have six patrol vehicles, be it vans, cars. Some stations would have two cars out. There'd be a couple of people on the beat on the main street areas where there's like a social life. And slowly over the years, stations closed, less patrol cars. And suddenly, after maybe eight or nine years, I discovered one night Turning to my colleague, Anna, Anna, why are we the only patrol car covering the entire district when that was six to eight cars prior? And if your response time wasn't good enough, please explain. <sighs> why did it take you this long to get from A to B? Well, it's seven kilometers. What do you expect? But yeah, there was a real dichotomy of, hang on, eight years ago, there was, we were killing each other to get to calls. To, and, and now we ha- actually have a list of calls to go to because we're the only patrol car covering what used to be dealt with by six to eight. If, if if my memory serves me right, back in, you know, 2010, the, the unit would have been, it would have been one sergeant and maybe 10 guards with it. Yeah. How, small, how much did it contract? Did it get smaller? At some point it would have been one plus four or five. Wow. When annual leave became very difficult to get. Uh, the embargo had a huge part to play on that, obviously. Uh, it all kind of came to a head for me in 2017, 2018. I went to one particular incident, which was fairly gruesome. My mental health started taking a little bit of a dip after that. And I remember actively thinking, yeah, I need to I need to get off the, the beat or off the streets. I say on the streets as if I'm a lady of the night, but off the streets as in on the beat. And um, and then an opportunity came up to go into the communication centre, which I took in a heartbeat. I was the only one from the district who applied, but I, I figured a change is as good as a rest. And I don't look back, I don't regret that. But just to talk about the, the, the good times, shall we say, what did you enjoy? Like, was it... Did you, did, was it a sense of sink or swim in the streets or did you have the backup of your supervisors? Were they, did they have your back? There was plenty of personnel and enough work that everyone could keep ticking over. We weren't overworked. If you needed help, no problem. A colleague would come to help you. If you needed a night doing files, catching up on paperwork, no problem because there are nine other guards there to take over. Uh, annual leave was not a problem. So you could have like a social life and still spend time in your personal life. Yeah, I think it was workload. Again, going back to one patrol car versus eight patrol mm-hmm. cars, uh, when there was six to eight on a night shift, we'd all be having the crap. We go to an incident. There's plenty to go around. Whereas when you're the only patrol car, you know there's no real help coming. It's no, there's no one close by. Yeah, that's because- one thing I always find really interesting. I, a lot of people would message me and say, "Mick, I've just seen six guard cars flying through Inchcore, and everybody thinks it's a murder." And I go, "No, guards tend to do that. They do go because they're an unarmed, largely unarmed. I always think because they're not a largely unarmed force, oh. they need more numbers there. So seeing six cars." It wouldn't be out of the ordinary for you going to a scene. It's not a massive it's unusual drama. now. I'd be I'd be surprised now if I saw six marked patrol cars going in the one direction. I'd be like, where the hell have those patrol cars come from and who's driving them? Uh, but yeah, like again, some nights you, you wouldn't get a call from the start of the night to the end. The volume of calls is obviously going up now yeah. as well. No, I don't, I don't yeah. know what I can say, obviously. Statistically, it seems like the volume of calls is going up. Personnel numbers are going down. At one point, we'd feck all patrol cars. I don't know if you remember that. We were crying mm-hmm. every- cars we were driving a 07 Mondeo that had something like 300,000 miles on the clock now would you like that would you like to see that chasing or in pursuit of of any any high power vehicle nah it's going to pop out on you at any moment what were your ambitions when you joined the guard did you want to get into a specialist unit did you want to go up the ladder what were you happy to be a guard I was happy to be a guard I mean when I first joined I was like oh wouldn't the dog unit be fun but it's just kind of like That'd be something fun to do. The dog, you know, so, but other than that, I just wanted an easy life. I've always wanted just an easy life, chill, have the crack, have enough time off that I can go on my holidays and have enough money to permit me to do that. I've never been hugely money, money motivated. Even saying that sentence is a privilege in and of itself. If I have enough money to pay my bills, get by, have a social life and go on my holidays, I am happy. We're not here for a long time. 
What incidents stand out for you on the, let's call it the regular? Good, good ones. Well, it's up to you to say whatever whatever ones stand out. Obviously, the bad ones come to the, the forefront mm. of my mind first. Good ones with good results. There was one incident, it started off bad. I was patrolling with the same colleague, Anna. Hello, Anna, if you're listening. And we were driving along a dual carriageway, looked up and I could see long blonde hair extensions and legs climbing out over the railings of a bridge. I was like, Anna, whoop, we need to go up there. So we did the, the do that, jumped out, ran over, grabbed a hold of this girl, yanked her back over with the assistance of Anna back over the railings, brought her back and continued with the, the due procedure. That was all dealt with. Um, that's not a nice incident, but I think it was a really good result. And while I'm not going to paint myself or portray myself as a hero every single day, all day as a guard, I'm sure many people would snuff at that. But uh, I was really proud of my actions on that night that, I, that we happened to be driving by. We were just doing a regular patrol, spotted that, acted, and it ended well for everyone concerned. Uh, I remember thinking to myself, I'm really proud of that. I'm, I think I did a really good job there. And then I don't... Well, you see it the life. Well, potentially. I don't like tooting my own horn. But if you believe you've done good work, you can fill out what's called an EPW1 form. It's called Excellent Police Work Form, right? Crane that you have to do that, to do that yourself anyway. So you fill in the form, the incident details, your information, da, 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 and you forward it up to your sergeant, to the superintendent, in the hopes that this form will be acknowledged, and it'll be put on your file. Yeah, Laura did great work here. The fact that you have to write that yourself, that's not great, is it? No. But I remember thinking that day, fuck this. I am very proud and I'm going to do up one. To this day, I've not received acknowledgement of it. So you, you, I think it's clear that you saved someone from death or serious harm and there's been no acknowledgement. Mm. I remember feeling very disheartened by that. I really thought even a little report saying, well done, Laura, work well done. We've put this on your file. That would have taken two minutes to do to this day. And that probably happened 10 years ago. So I don't expect it to come through. Certainly not now that I'm speaking to the media. But tell me this. On the other side of the the coin, I suppose, there's this thing that guards get called please explain. Mm. Would you have got please explain? I presume you would. So there would have been negative, uh, what's the word, a negative overwatch on you to say, can you explain why you did this, Garda Young? Yeah, and that became more frequent as time went on. More policies and procedures put into place. Um, The public making complaints, some vexatious, is that the word, vexatious? Mm -hmm. And some vexatious means like non non-substantial yeah yeah well yeah. You're, you're doing it to wind you up really i suppose yeah i remember i was present on a drug search before they have to bring a female member on every drug search if there is a female present to search them um there wasn't a female in the house at the time so i just kind of sat around scratching my arse to be completely honest um assisting with the search where i could and next thing a please explain came because this guy was alleging that someone thieved from his house during the search i was giving a please explain and i was like i didn't even barely remember being there but again it's right that those procedures are in place for members of the public to make their complaints, for sure. I think he suffered with mental health issues. Not that that's, I, I, I don't think anyone robbed his diary from, from the house. But yeah, lots of police explains, lots of procedures. It actually became way more frequent, frequent when I went into the communication centre. My God, is there uh, accountability in there? And yeah, it is right. But if you put a comment on a call, you have to stand by that comment, even if there's a typo in it. Yeah, it's mad. It's mad. You really are under scrutiny. And I would say micromanaged. So things obviously changed internally for you. Your Maybe your attitude changed or became, is it fair to say you became disillusioned with, within the guards? Uh, disillusioned. Uh, yeah, disheartened, I think, is a better one. Just like, oh, I thought, I thought we were a team. I thought we were a team. And then I realised, no, we are a team as the guards. But management are not part of our team. In fact, it felt like they were a team opposing us at times. Ex- expand on that why do you think that is have you ever heard the expression throwing someone under the bus someone needs to be hung out to dry for every every wrongdoing and of course the shit flows downwards always and it's going to be some poor old mule <laughs> who's put on the line for anything that's gone wrong now you've raised a great word there it's one of my favorite words but most people outside the job wouldn't really know this guards yes. call themselves mules mm. Why I've always asked people that is because they did all the shit jobs and have to carry all the heavy stuff. That's what I was told. That's what I was told. Yeah. Now I don't know why banners are called banners. Vanguard is shortened to banner. Yeah. I'm not sure. But mules, I think it's yeah because they're on the ground. They have to do all the the heavy lifting. It, it's funny. Say, sometimes people DM me and they say they're guards, and I go, oh, "Are you a mule?" And they go, "Oh what?" Oh, and then you know straight away. Yeah. So it, you know, so because what I, guard I, doesn't I, know what a mule is? I do social media, and sometimes. Uh, someone will message me 
trying to do guard and sneak and I'd be like mule and they'd be like excuse me oh yeah no catch it it's like I, it's I, it's yeah it's like stolen valor in America all those gazers who pretend to be you know special forces fella yeah. um, so you became dis- disheartened and it, it strikes me that one of the issues for you or, or for maybe for your colleagues as well was it, was it very did the guards become very bureaucratic yeah, red tape, lots of lots of paperwork to be done. You need to be good at admin rather than being a good police person. Uh, it became so I mentioned earlier about eight patrol cars suddenly becoming mm. one patrol car covering the district. Workload has increased so much, but yet there's so few working that you can't get a day or two days on files to carry carry out your inquiries. So things naturally, of course, are going to slip. Sergeant isn't always able to give you the time to do these things, even though you might be begging. I remember struggling with that. Like, I need a night on files. I can't give you a night for another two weeks. Well, I have stuff that's about to go statute barred in three. So I'm going to get in trouble if I don't get these done. There was, there was a lot of that. And it's just kind of, you shrug your shoulders, you just have to get on with it. All right. And so you not only do you not get your night on files, you have to go out in the patrol car and you're picking up more things to do, adding more to the list. So your list is going from this to this you might get one thing done to this get one thing done to this i know i'm doing a visual here and this is only audio but i'm basically showing how lists you might one two steps forward one step back etc yeah and so did it start to get you down for sure for sure but then um whatever it was about where i worked mental health is a huge huge issue where i worked i don't know even the doctors who we used to call to consult with our um i don't want to say prisoners but it is you've arrested them for the mental health mm-hmm. acts they are technically prisoners he even said, I don't know what it is about this area. I get three times more mental health calls for here than I do anywhere else. So I don't know what the science is to that. Um, but, but that's, really, that's a really good point. But I think people outside, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the DMR, Dublin Metropolitan Region. Through, throughout Ireland, mental health is a massive issue for guards. In other words, they have to deal with people suffering mental health crises oh, on a daily got, basis. It got to the point where every day shift or every night shift didn't matter. You'd expect to get at least one mental health call. In fact, some nights you'd go from one to the next to the next. It could be three or four in a row. And if you if you believe the person is a danger to themselves or others, you're obligated to arrest them under Section 12 of the Mental Health Act. How much training do you think we have gotten on the Mental Health Act or how to deal with someone who is potentially suicidal? I'm going to say very little. Half a day, maybe. Wow. Not even. I think they do get it now. My brother has since joined the organisation. Mm-hmm. I think there is a little bit more. But you're effectively expected to be like an interim little psychiatric, psychiatric like doctor or something. Um, so we have to make the call if we believe someone. We, we use, I used to have to make the call if I thought someone was a danger to themselves or others. You'd arrest them, bring them back. Um, but sorry, what I was going to say was because there's so many mental health problems seemingly in our area, there's a lot of suicides. And they were becoming all the more frequent. There was one particular incident. My me- mental health took a little bit of a dip after this. Um, and it kind of seemed to slide on a downward trajectory from then on. But I won't go into the details, but essentially a group of us in the middle of the night in a straight line with our gloves on and our hands, we were walking along a train track picking up body parts. I remember picking up these. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will, I'll spare you the details. After that, we had a SISM debrief, critical and critical incident support mechanism or something like that uh, with a qualified person. Uh, several people broke out down into tears. And from then on, I made the decision that the next chance I was going to get to get off the street, I was going to take it. And then I went into the office. Um, my mental health problems didn't really um, get any better going into the office. I did have more fun. Uh, but the stress of being in the communication center really got to me. A very small room. We called it like a fishbowl, like a little glass bowl. Everyone can see everything and you can hear anyone from the room the other side of the room there were aspects i really enjoyed of the communication center but again it started to go down the same route where there were four people doing a job suddenly it became three and then it became two and suddenly you're one person uh taking over all these districts um and that, was, that was in harcourt square was it the, it was the in it no longer exists have you seen it yeah. no, in yeah. military road it's military road now isn't it is it is that it? oh yeah it's over near houston oh. somewhere i was never in yeah. there oh. yeah 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 Ooh. how different was it being in the in the 999 call center oh completely different you don't feel like a police person in there at all um essentially so what what i was doing was i was dispatching for the most part so how it works is if a civilian a member of the public rings 999 on one side of the room someone will take that call da 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 put it on the computer and when they hit enter it'll come over onto my screen and my role was to find a patrol car to go to it and if none was available make a note on the call why no one is able to go to this call so if the Blanchardstown car um is busy which they always are spoiler alert uh, in the k the k cars are always busy if someone rang in to say their flower pot has been stolen from outside their house 
I have to make a note on the call. The Blanchestown calls so currently have a prisoner. Um, there's 23 other calls holding. This will be dealt with in due course. Um, so obviously that was a lot. It was a, there was a lot of that sort of thing in the, in the control room, which is fine. But then suddenly if a chase happened or two chases happened at the same time, suddenly you have to really be on ask like loads of tons of different like bureaucratic questions of the driver try to remember all your stay safe principles all the laws you have to say on the radio so it's all documented make notes on the calls yeah those are stressful or obviously if there's been a, a murder or a very serious incident it would be very very stressful uh, just about the pursuits do you have to do you have to add or ask a, a set number of or set oh, questions uh, you're triggering me now yeah so at the start you were basically asking um Direction of travel, just so I can relay to other patrol cars what way this is heading for. Makes sense. That's common sense. Yeah. Um, and then the driver would often give you the make, model and reg. And I could get assistance from someone to look up the details on that. We can determine if it's a stolen car or not. Makes sense. Suddenly management, who I'd say have never dispatched or even maybe been in a pursuit before in their entire lives, came out with this um, policy or procedure that was put in place where I had to ask a list of like, it was nine questions, then it became 12. It could be 15 or 20 now for all we know. And I had to establish all this information from the driver. Who is under pressure from the get-go? What's the weather like? What are the road conditions like? What's your level of training? Uh, are you aware of the stay safe principles of, I forget the year now. Are you aware of 54 of 14? I have to ask all these things and note them on the call member aware of 55 as if i haven't enough to be doing and the member themselves have enough to be doing trying to relay information to you they must i'd say the driver they're thinking would you ever shut the heck up asking me this stupid question but it's all about arse covering box ticking the stay safe principles are you know that you're in charge here and if anyone gets hurt it's on you it's all about um arse covering basically so is it to say if there's a two-person crew the driver and the observer is yeah. it does the observer answer the questions or does it have yeah, to be the driver, the driver. It, would, it would never be both sometimes it is the driver because they'll have a push to talk on the steering wheel it, it depends but either way they're under pressure i don't even the observer's under pressure mm. i'd say that must be very stressful for you and for them it must get very snappy did it get snappy sure it did i mean sure oh, it, it absolutely did you'd even have, like have other radios coming over like jesus control would you leave them alone they're, they're under pressure I know, but my inspector's standing on my shoulder wanting me to get all this information. So you're listening to the car, you're trying to do a red check on this computer and your manager's standing over your shoulder. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. You have an adrenaline dump and my adrenaline dump usually translates as nausea. I would often have to go and get sick afterwards. I know that even when I was in car chases myself as an observer, I would often have to get sick afterwards, but it actually happened to be in control quite a lot as well. It sounds really stressful. It was stressful. It was, and then we had quite a lot of breaks and we had a gym and stuff, but it was a stressful environment. Look, 80% of the time, it was grand, but by God, that 20% of the time make up for it. And it's not that you had any notice. A chase can happen at any second. And there's members roaring down the radio. It is, I don't, I, I don't want to seem like I'm dramatizing here, but it is a very stressful environment for that 20% of the time. It definitely evens out in the wash. So that was about 2018, was it, that you went into community? Like, uh, yeah, 2018, I went into command and control in October, November, and I was there till I resigned, basically. Okay. Towards the end, did you dread going into work? Yeah. Really? Yeah, there's one particular moment I remember, and I remember exactly what desk I was on. And it wasn't even a particularly busy night. It was quite quiet. And I sat there and I sobbed. Um, I okay. sobbed and I couldn't explain why. And a colleague came over to me and he was like, I know he suffers with mental health as well. And he was like, are you OK? And I was like, I can't even speak to you right now. God, I did not expect to get emotional. I really struggled in that place. I really struggled. It all came to a head. Do you remember the cancel call saga? Yeah, this was 999 calls and it was a big saga. There were was. You know, loads and loads and loads of calls that were cancelled. Very serious ones. Some very of serious. Ones. So you I were caught up in that. I was caught up in that, but let me explain. So as I mentioned earlier, when someone calls into 999, call taker puts it in, presses enter, comes onto my screen. Alarm calls, this, this is the same incident happened twice. An alarm call came over via an alarm company, a monitoring company. Mr. Bloggs isn't home. Alarm is going off. We can't get through to him. Send a patrol car. So I'm sending a patrol car. Alarm company rings back again and says, oh, about Mr. Bloggs, we actually got in touch with him. Everything is fine. He had the code word. Perfect. So the uh, call taker would tell me, hey, guards are no longer required here, as verified by the alarm company. I cancelled the call. I did that twice. I found myself at somewhat of a tribunal in front of a board of like three different officers. I had representation with me via the, the union. 
I was questioned for two and a half hours about these two alarm calls. Like, what a waste of time. And then left for an hour and three quarters in the next room. And I remember my pits being, I remember my shirt being drenched despite having showered just before my interview. And I remember thinking, I'm not doing this anymore. And I didn't. I never went back to work. But you were, I'm not going to say cleared because that was, that's the wrong word, yes. but you were found to have acted properly. Found to be not in breach. Yes, found to be not in breach. Yeah, thankfully. And were you relieved when they told you that? Or were you angry? No, I, I was relieved because it could have gone either way. They could have said, no, you technically shouldn't have cancelled those calls. And technically, were they right? Maybe. I was just hoping common sense would prevail. You can't rely on that these days, though. And, and, it, and it did. But also, I was the first one interviewed, so I was going to be setting a precedence. So there was an immense pressure on my interview as well, because I was going to be setting precedence for everyone coming after me. Look, some of those members allegedly cancelled calls that were of a very serious nature, but most of us were in my boat. And of course, that was huge all over the media. And I was like, I'm embroiled in that. I'm embroiled in that part of me. At this stage of your career, because I think we may have spoken about this, had the public turned against you? Against the guards. So in other words, did you tell people you were a guard? Did you get grief for being a guard outside the job? I was always proud of my job. And I loved, as I mentioned, I loved that reaction. of like, what, you're a guard? Because usually I'd be in full glam or whatever. And people wouldn't expect it because I have a bit of a personality, allegedly. I was always proud of it, but towards the end, I wasn't. And really? now. All the bad press. People assume you're a crook or you're corrupt or you're lazy. And I did have lazy days, but I wasn't lazy for the most part. Just the reputation of the stereotype, the stereotype, the stigma. Mm. I don't want to say discrimination because that's going into a whole different realm, but it kind of felt like discrimination. But I definitely was proud in the end. And so the after I resigned, I was asked, like, hand back in your uniform and your badge and all the rest. Happy to. Want really? No, want nothing to do with this, yeah. And a few members even were like, would you not lose the old badge? No. What am I doing? What am I doing? Keep a keepsake. I wasn't in the Maldives for 14 years. No, I don't need a keepsake. I handed everything back gladly. Glad. How did it feel when you resigned? I remember sending the email. I had to go into work to send the email, obviously, through the pulse system. And one of my work besties was sitting beside me. And he was like, did you just do it? I said, yeah, I hit send. He's like, I can't believe you just did it just like that. I am impulsive. But it was like a weight lifted off. And I was just so excited. And I went out for a beer afterwards. I was so excited. And I'm still so excited. I'm still so excited. I can't believe I've done it. Can't believe how, I've long, done it. how long did you have to serve or to work? Before? Was it a month's notice or did you have to give or did you just go? My, I was due back to work on the 4th. I sent the email on the 1st. Uh, I'm resigning with immediate effect. Forward wow. of Yeah. And the reply I got back was just as curt. All the best. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So that was it. Sinead, that was you no, going. No, no, ask why. Yeah, Grand see you. Yeah. Oh, here's the protocol for giving back your uniform. Wow. And uh, uh, say, for example, when I'm uh, when I'm on holiday, you know, say I take two weeks off because my job, you know, it, it can be stressful. Yeah. For the first week, you're 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 sort of coming down and you only start to enjoy yourself. And the second week, you only really relax then because you're, you're sort of still wired. Were you still wired when you left? Did it take you a while to come down or were you that was it and gone? Uh, I hit the ground running. I got a new job. I had I had my new job secured a couple of weeks prior. I was just waiting for some financial things to go over mm. the line before I actually um I actually did the official resignation. So honestly, I just went from one job straight to another. I'm working in the nonprofit now. So and did your mental health improve once you left? Definitely, definitely. I don't even know how wow. to describe it. There were periods of time where. God, it's so hard to describe, like on my rest days, the familiar rest days where your days mm. off. I'd be sitting there after having a rough few days in work. I'd sit there in my dressing gown for like all day, every day. And if someone had WhatsApp me, I'd look at my phone. I wouldn't have the energy to WhatsApp back. And that sounds so, if you'd said this to me 10 years ago, I'd been like, what are you on about? Didn't have the energy to write back to people. And that's when I went to my doctor and went to my uh, psychotherapist and the doctor basically put me on the meds and my psychotherapist was like, you're burnt out. You are completely burnt out. And she was like, I hate to say I told you so, but I've been telling you this is coming for a while. And lo and behold, it did. It hit me like a freight train. Um, I also struggled 
a little bit after leaving. You mentioned there was I like we didn't say this, but was I elated for a while afterwards? I struggled for about a month afterwards. I was dreaming every night that I was showing up for work and they wouldn't let me in. Or I was dreaming that I was in the middle of a shift and suddenly I realized I'm not I'm not being paid here. And I'd get up to leave and they wouldn't let me out. It sounds so woo woo. So I discussed these with my therapist and she was like, Laura, you've left your tribe. Think about it. Like if you were a caveman, you'd have left your tribe Mm. and you're really vulnerable because you've lost your tribe now. So, you know, you know, have to create your new tribe. And this is completely normal. And she said it should subside in a month or six or eight weeks, whatever. And it did. I don't dream about that anymore. Tell me, what has the reaction been of your colleagues, your former colleagues? Everyone bar one, congratulations, would love to have the balls to do it too. Only I have a kids and a mortgage. Only one person came back with something negative. This person said, I think you're, I think you're making a huge mistake. And I was kind of like, that's fair enough. You can think that, but don't say that to me because I've done it already. I've pulled the plug. It was a bit insensitive, but everyone else, congrats. I wish I had the balls. So does that make you believe that there were there would be plenty of other guardy oh. who would who would do it, who would resign if they could? There's a lot of people who can't. Financial and f- familial commitments. There's a lot of people that can't. And there's a lot of people who still love the job, who don't want to. But there's lots of people reaching out to me like I'm looking for any other option. There are people who I know live, eat and breathe the job who are looking for new jobs right now. Just to see if anything comes up. So that sounds as if we're heading to a very dangerous area. For sure. And you're losing seniority as well. These people who are reaching out to me are not rookies. These people have my service or more. And those are valuable. Uh-huh. Not like, I'm not saying that rookies aren't valuable. Of course they are. But it's people who experience who you need to help the new, the new people. Do you regret joining the guards? As cliche as it sounds, no, because it wouldn't have me to where I am today. I've learned a lot about myself through the guards. Have I become more of a cynic? Yes, and I'm definitely trying to unwork that. I'm definitely a cynic. I assume everyone is lying to me. There are certain institutionalized um, tendencies that I have, but I'm trying to undo them bit by bit. But that's going to take more than a year after 14, 15 years in that job. You're right. much the same, I'd say. Oh, well, well, I, I burned out. I've probably burned out twice. It, it just, you know, it, it, it's very hard for people not involved in what you or I do to understand. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always say this. I, I, I haven't arrested anybody, but I've covered a thousand deaths more. You know, I, I stood outside do- houses for 24 hours, 12 hours, you know, and I, I think that's, I think one of the reasons I think certain journalists, as in mostly crime reporters and busy reporters, have a sort of connection with guards because you all see the same shit. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. No, yeah. it's slightly yeah. different. It's yeah. a humour as a coping mechanism. I'm trying, to undo, I'm trying to undo that as well because the dark sense of humour doesn't really work on the outside. I have a ter- most cry- and most journalists I know we have a terribly dark sense of humour, but nobody gets to hear about it except us because it's. I think it's our, you know, it's our, our way of protecting ourselves. For sure, most funeral directors I know as well. Dark sense of humour. Exactly, Laura. Yeah. This has been a fantastic interview. I have one final question to ask, and I think it's a very important question. What's your advice for how can the garden management? Re- get to retain guardy who are considering quitting what do they need to do isn't that a million dollar question and they're not paying me so i'm not going to do a full consultation on that no seriously um from what i've learned over the years management are very slow to notice let alone acknowledge a problem so if the trend continues and this is the same way i believe everything has been i think by the time management notice and i'm sure they have noticed by now of course they've noticed acknowledge and then actually take action i suspect it might be too late and i don't want to sound dramatic by saying too late but as i mentioned numbers dwindling workload going up especially with um increased bureaucracy i think we've already fallen below the threshold there's supposed to be a certain amount of police per capita i don't know is there that at the moment um there has never been a because remember the gra were always talking about this there has never really been a study for optimum numbers well so it depends on the country yeah. Well. yeah Yeah, Yeah. I'm sure some countries have. So the management of the Department of Justice never said, right, how many guards do we need for the population we have? So that's never been done. But they they, and they always talk about, you know, the the increasing. But the the number of like just to explain to listeners, okay, so 109 people resigned last year, but another maybe 350 retired. And and how many? This is just off the top of my head. Maybe 300 went in through Temple Moore. So that's a deficit. That's a reduction. And people don't understand this because it's completely negative. Because people see about you know stories about resignations, 
but did, nobody really talks about the retirements yeah. and the, the way it works in the guards after 30 years you can you, you can go but you have to go by 60 yeah. and they're losing an awful lot of you mentioned seniority and experience they're losing an awful lot of really really experienced people yeah. but also people as you say who have got 14 15 16 17 18 years experience and that's invaluable as well so you know it's from an outside perspective it's very worrying so it's funny you mentioned uh pension and retirement so mm. i was 35 when i was on the cusp when i had that big camel straw the camel that broke straw that broke camel's back moment 35 um the contract i signed meant i would have to work time 55 so i was i have 14 15 years in my pocket but i have 20 more to go and i was like it's time to shit or get off this pocket i can't do another 20 years of this 10 i might have powered through 20 absolutely the fuck not no not a chance life is too short when we said that earlier um if i end up working a menial job on minimum wage so be it again as long as my bills are paid and i'm reasonably comfortable i don't care but I just do not want to end up in a stressful situation as I was before. Is your was your story unique, or do you think there are hundreds or thousands of people oh. who experience everything you have? The messages I've gotten on my phone for the la since I've done the first interview have been like I could have said that myself. That was exactly what I. That was exactly you. There are my thoughts encapsulated. So that's very worrying from the outside perspective. It is. I can't speak for everyone, but I can only speak from what I'm hearing. Okay. Laura, I really, I think I've kept you long enough. I really, really appreciate your time. And this has been a fantastic interview. And thank you very much. Thanks a million, Mick.